a daily basis, you see some people that actually are overworked or tired or angry <laughs> or overweight or unmotivated, distracted, <coughs> unhappy, feeling isolated. The truth is that one in four people are affected by mental health in the world. This is a $1 trillion per year problem. It's really an issue that we have to support. Now, what is common about these pictures that I just showed you? What do you see? So there's some humans, obviously. But there's also a very interesting situation. These are all indoors. We spend almost 90% of our time indoors and in cars. We have become an indoors species, despite our beautiful long legs and beautiful long arms that are used to roam and to hunt. We chest type now. And the other problem that's behind all of these things is the stress. You know, there's a lot of stress associated with all these situations, either causing them or actually as a result of that. And in reality, stress doesn't only affect your mind, doesn't only affect mental health, it affects your whole body. There are so many outcomes. Yeah, don't read the fine print, but you can get sick of anything almost because of stress. Eight, eight in 10 Americans actually report some sort of stress issues, and it's about a $300 billion per year problem just in this country. Now, let's look at the stress a little bit. So this is a favorite book of mine. You know, Robert Sapolsky, I spoke with him actually a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking like, you know, why zebras don't have ulcers? Well, because they actually do something about stress when they get stressed. Humans, not so much. And the problem is that, you know, as you get, you know, excited by stress to survive and basically as a fundamental way of like, you know, saving your own life, you know, this is very good and, and so, but humans actually don't do a good job of recovering. You know, these little spikes will be uh, what I consider a normal recovery period, but as if you don't give enough time to recover, eventually the stress accumulates and it can lead to some disease. And this is what's happening to a lot of us. That's why we have disease. Stress inherently is not bad. As a matter of fact, stress is actually necessary. If you look at some of the studies behind this, you need stress to actually perform. Now, too much stress will actually make you perform less, or too little stress, it's also not so good for you. So stress is necessary, but it's really not helping if you don't do that. Now, let's look at the zebra a bit more carefully, right? The zebra, it has a great stress hygiene. It basically always reduces the stress every time they need because it's running. But there is a peculiarity about the zebra that I think is very important. It needs a prairie to run. You need a field to run. And we used to live in fields in the past, but we don't anymore. So we don't have the field. So what is our new ecology? What's our new wild? Our new wild looks like this. Chairs and desks and lamps, and we still get stressed, though. I wish we didn't, because we don't have a place to run. I would argue that poor zebra will actually die of a heart attack if the lion came and there was no field. I'm like, oh my god, where do I run? Right? At least they had worked around, but we don't. And that's what's happening. We're actually dying out of heart attacks. So the new wild is indoors. Now, how do we deal with the new wild? I think instead of trying to remove people from the wild, from this new wild, let's just look at this wild more carefully and let's work on designing a stress management, internet of things in the wild. That's what I come to propose. That's what I do. I want to make chairs and desks and lamps and everything you have around help you reduce the stress, as opposed to asking you to go into a retreat every three months and just breathe. <laughs> so a little bit about me. I actually quit a business career to try to solve the mental health technology gap. I grew up in Ecuador. I have a family member who suffers from a mental disorder, and we never got enough support. Um, but I noticed that technology can help. And right now, I'm very focused on well-being and health. I uh, actually have a PhD in computer science, and I focus in like many technologies that help us build this new uh, IoT. But I actually work in the School of Medicine. 
some uh, faculty at School of Medicine, but I'm an engineer. They are starting to hire more engineers, which is pretty cool. And the reason they are doing that is because they are interested in this concept of health, which was proposed many decades ago. Health is not the absence of disease. It's way more than that. But the medical profession has been focusing too much on disease. So how do we move beyond that, right? That's what I'm trying to do, how to focus on health. And more preci precisely, how do we focus on precision health and mental health, which is not precision medicine. Precision medicine is how do we measure exactly what's going on in you and how do I actually cut the perfect part of your body to make you feel better. No, precision health is moving towards like monitoring people. Look at this uh, chart, you know, jet engines are being monitored hundreds of second, uh, hundreds of times per second. Humans are monitored once a year. How are we going to know that somebody is healthy and keep it healthy if it's monitored once a year? So that's why I'm also interested in, you know, this whole notion of like, you know, IoT. Let's make, you know, your house, your car, your chair, your bed, your toilet. Let's make them into devices that can help you improve your quality of living and your health. It is possible and it's actually ongoing right now. Now let's look at stress management for a second. So yeah, we have the zebra and people get stressed and actually detection and understanding of stress is not that much of a difficult thing. I, if I ask somebody, are you stressed? I would say, yeah, I am. And usually they are right. Now do something about it. That's when it gets tricky, right? You know, if you look actually at the efficiency of our healthcare system, about 60 to 80% of the visits to primary care are due to some form of psychological stress and only about 3% of them get some kind of like stress management advice. They usually send them with like, hey, take a, take a pill, right? And you will feel better. That's not what people need. Now, maybe mental health can help us, but you know, what do you think is the mental health efficiency? Mental health efficiency, uh, therapy efficiency, is like how many of the people who need help actually do get help? Not not whether you actually do everything. When you do everything a psychologist tells you, you usually get better. No. How many of all the people around the world actually get help? Do you guess? I have a number. Five? Ten percent? No. It's worse than that. Way worse than that. Like out of that one quarter of the population, about ten percent get referred to a specialist. About, from those ten percent, about twenty percent of those actually complete uh, diagnosis. From those twenty percent, about one third complete treatment, and from those one third, about one third do not relapse. So mental health is really not efficient. It might work for those who do it, but most people just don't help, get help. Now, let's go back to the human then. If nobody can help me, like why aren't you doing stress management if you know this in stress management? Maybe you don't know, maybe that's the reason, but the top two reasons for not doing a stress management are actually lack of willpower and lack of time. A stressed person is very stressed and very busy. You go to a stressed person and say, like, hey, you're stressed? Yeah, I'm stressed. Take a break. I'm like, I'm stressed. I have no time. What are you talking about? <laughs> you're stressing me out by asking me to take a break. <laughs> Stop it, right? So what I want to do is transform the office, the car, the home into like a well-being and stress management, IoT. You know, these are all projects that were already pursuing, and I'm going to give you a couple of ideas around this that we've been exploring. One is this sensorless sensing notion. Can we actually sense the stress repurposing things that we already have? So we make it super cheap. So for example, one project that we published is like, can we use the way you move the mouse as a way of sensing stress? Turns out that when you get stressed, your muscles get tense because that's exactly what stress does in you. Well, then the way you move the mouse is just slightly different. We proved it scientifically. You can read uh, this paper, the Fast and Furious paper. Can we actually repurpose the car? We did the same. We actually look at the way you take turns. It turns out that when you take turns under stress, it's slightly different than when you take turns without stress. And I'm not talking about adding sensors. We just look at how you move the steering wheel. This is actually already a signal that you can get from any car. We can repurpose the car as a stress sensor. Added cost, pretty much zero. Or some of the cool work that coming from uh, MIT and Dina Katabi, you know, can we repurpose Wi-Fi? You can actually see your breathing rate and heart rate just by the way Wi-Fi rebounds on you. Let's repurpose Wi-Fi. See, we're repurposing things. We don't need, even need to deploy new stuff. It's 
basically for free. It's just we need to do good science behind that. But let's talk about the interventions. Okay, fine, we can sense, but again, that's not the problem. We know we're stressed. Come on. It is about like, what do I do? Right, help me do something. So one of the things I'm very interested in is the commute. 50 million Americans spend about 60 minutes per day commuting every single freaking day, twice a day. Now, let's transform this bug into a feature. Can we use the commute for you to relax? I've been asking my colleagues in the School of Medicine, it's like, hey, take a break, you know, you're burned out, you're stressed, and I'm like, I have no time. Like, what about the commute? And like, hmm, maybe the commute, maybe in the car, if you give me some applications to breathe. I might do something. So that's exactly what we want to do, repurpose this waste of time. So why don't we breathe slowly for a second, just so you get to feel you know, how it feels. Just 10 seconds of slow breathing. Just sit down and do as slow, slow as you can. 10 seconds of slow breathing. All right, how did that feel? 10 seconds. Can we do it while we're driving? That's exactly the question we ask, and we basically got people in a car, in a simulator, in this case, driving, and we get them, we stimulated them with a chair. The chair guided them to breathe slowly, and we were able to get them to breathe slowly and drive well. So, hey, we can breathe in the car slowly, right? So we can do slow breathing in the car. The only problem is that when we went into the autonomous condition, the autonomous driving was actually a huge problem. This poor guy actually, after a few seconds, was already like falling asleep. So if you want to have an autonomous driving, make sure that it drives or you drive. Don't take those like in the middle type of thing. Because, you know, but we can do actually fast breathing for this case. We actually investigated, can we do fast breathing? Fast breathing helps wake up. And this also worked really well. We can actually guide people to move in the car. The chair can help you to move, to stretch, to guide you to move your torso. We can do guided movement with a chair. We can actually do something very interesting. Instead of guiding you, why don't I force you to move? Turns out that, you know, in the, the CD stand desk, it's a fascinating uh, creature in the ecology. It turns out that a CD stand desk, you know, basically uh, people spend uh, most of the time sitting after three months because of apathy. Now, why don't we make a robotic seat stand that goes up and down without asking you? And that's exactly what we did. <laughs> we forced people to move up and down, and people just go up <laughs> and work. We have chairs that can basically also be make become uncomfortable after a while, so you can take a break. Or we have these plays and chairs that have these very subtle interventions that you don't even feel them, that they actually give you this subconscious reality. We can actually stimulate your breathing rate without you even noticing it. You're just typing, and we're doing it. So at the end of the day, as you can see, there's breathing, there's movement, there's a bunch of little things that you can do. And I please ask you to do it. But I think our new ecology, our new wild, should be the place that helps us. Our new prairie helps us reduce the stress. So I invite you to send me you know, any type of messages, ideas, or whatever, to keep designing the new stress management IoT in the wild. And I'll see you soon, hopefully sitting somewhere. Thank you very much. That's me.